Now our scripture reading today will be taken from Romans chapter 2. If you'd open your Bibles there, please, Romans chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the first 16 verses of the second chapter of Romans as we continue on. I'm going to point out some things as we read the text this morning before we pray, beginning at verse 1 of Romans 2. Therefore, that immediately is going to connect us certainly back to the preceding context, you have no excuse. Now, I want to point out, and we'll talk about this, but you'll notice there's a change in pronouns from they to you. If you come off verse 32 of chapter 1, they know the ordinance of God. Those who practice such things are worthy of death. They, you can see the pronouns they being used there, and those and them. Now you come to verse 1 of Romans chapter 2, therefore you. So he changes the pronoun to you. You have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. I want to point out that pronoun another. There are two pronouns in Greek, alas, another of the same kind, heteros, another of a different kind. And the particular pronoun that is used here is heteros, which is another of a different kind. So what you have here is you have people who are looking at that list of things that we see in chapter 1, and they're going, well, they're really different than we are. I mean, they're another of a different kind. That's what Paul is saying there. So you who judge those other people that you consider to be another of a different kind, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, There will be tribulation and distress for every soul. See, that's what's at stake here, the soul. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there's no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. That is one powerful passage of Scripture. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of it and the exposition of it to follow a little later. Will you join with me, please, in prayer? Our Father, we bow before thee today to praise thee, to worship thee, to thank thee. We thank you for all of the blessings that we enjoy. We have food to eat, plenty of it. We have plenty to drink. We have fresh air to breathe. We have nice homes. We have nice cars. We have money to pay our bills. We live in a country where we still have the great privilege of worshiping thee in freedom. We have your precious word, Lord, your precious word in our own language. What a blessing that is. And for those of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have salvation that you gave us. And so we thank you, dear Lord, for all of these things. And we ask that you would continue to work in our minds and hearts, that we would live lives that would be sensitive to thy spirit and to thy word. I pray we would always be concerned with what pleases you. Your precious son taught that you desire for us to bear fruit here, and we would ask, dear Lord, that you would allow us the privilege of bearing much fruit for thee. We want to pray for our government, the leaders that we have, Lord, that you have sovereignly allowed to be in office at all levels. We pray that you would turn their minds toward making right, just decisions that would benefit your people. 
We pray that you would cause leaders to realize the entrustment of power has actually come from thee, not the people, and they will be held accountable to thee for how they govern. Or this is a big week that we have in this church for surgeries. We think of Hank Ritzma for his cancer surgery on Tuesday and Becky Davis for her cancer surgery on Thursday and Dennis Fritz for his knee replacement surgery on Friday. We pray that all of these surgeries this week will be very successful. We pray you would guide the doctors and the nurses' skills to perform the surgery with pinpoint accuracy, bring your people through them safely. We pray that there would be no complications, there would be no infections, there would be no setbacks. We pray for total healing. We pray for those, Lord, who have lost loved ones. We especially think of the Alpha and our family and the memorial service tomorrow. We pray you grant comfort and strength and thy grace and peace to all who've lost loved ones. And Lord, in this passage of Scripture, we see the importance of honest, real, true spirituality. We pray you would grant that to every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Sunday, September 25. It's the first Sunday of the fall season. This is the day of the big game. This is the day that millions of people will go to their favorite venue to watch and participate in it. There was a lot of practice all week, but today is the day to get suited up and put on the big show. I'm not talking about the 15 NFL games today. I'm talking about the game of counterfeit spirituality. It's a game that will be played by millions and millions of people who will go to their favorite church to play it. It's the one day of the week when a person really gives effort to pretend to be something he isn't. It is the one day of a week when a person is really not himself. The game's simple to play. It's not complicated. A person will go to church and pretend to love God and his word, but behind the scenes, that person is living a life that's unholy and ungodly. The person playing the game knows that, but this game is played by pretending, and so that's what the person does. What the people playing this game don't seem to realize is God's the one keeping the score. And when this Sunday is over, the person who played that game will have lost another game, perhaps forever. The first thing that catches your eye when you come to the second chapter of Romans is verse 1, and the pronoun changes from they to you. Now, some suggest that based on verse 17, Paul's developing an argument against the moralist Jews that were looking down at the pagan Gentiles, and they were making their judgments. But the pronoun everyone that shows up in verse 1 seems to include anybody who makes judgments regardless of ethnicity. What we have described here is a moralist who can exist in the Jewish world and also can exist in the Gentile world. A moralist, this kind of person who plays this kind of religious game, can exist in any culture, in any dispensation, in any religion, and in any church. The point is there are some people who are quick to point out the sin of other people, but they're totally oblivious to their own sin problem And they're totally oblivious to the fact that they need the righteousness of God that they don't have. There are some people in religion who will applaud it when God pours out his wrath on what they would call the godless crowd. But they don't realize they too are heading to the judgment of God. You see, what Paul is trying to establish in this section of the book of Romans is all people need the righteousness of God. And all people need the righteousness of God that is only found by faith in Jesus Christ because all people are sinners. But some people don't see themselves as being bad sinners like those other people. And Paul says, you need to understand something. Apart from the righteousness of God that's found in Jesus Christ, you're heading to the same wrath they're heading to. Without the righteousness of God, you're all guilty. So what he writes in this series of verses is people who judge others for their sin have no excuse for not seeing their own sin in their own lives because they've done the same kind of things in their own lives. 
And they too need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. They too need the righteousness of God that they don't have. See, what this passage of Scripture says is you can be a very religious person here, and you you can be proud of the fact that you haven't done the things that are on that list we looked at last week. I mean, you can say, well, I've not been involved in those real bad things. And Paul's letter to the Romans proves two things. First of all, when God assesses any person's life, we've all done bad things. There isn't an innocent person. Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. And secondly, we all need the righteousness of God that's only found in Jesus Christ to be saved from our sins because we're all sinners. He develops those two themes very graphically and pointedly in this section of Scripture. So no matter how good a person thinks he or she may be, no matter how good they stack themselves up against other people, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, you do not have the righteousness of God, you do not have a relationship with God, and you're guilty and condemned because of your own sins. And what Paul is going to do from here to the end of chapter 3 is prove that all people are sinners, And all people have fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, all people need the righteousness of God because we're heading to the wrath of God without it. Now, there are two reasons Paul develops here why a moralist is guilty and condemned before the Lord. First of all, the moralist is guilty and condemned because the moralist does not judge himself honestly or accurately. We read in verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Now Paul starts out with that conjunction, therefore. And this is a strong, strong inferential conjunction that points back to the previous context. Some think it's connected to the entire preceding context, meaning every human being has knowledge of God, every human being has suppressed knowledge of God, God is abandoning people, and every man is without excuse. And then some say it points back to verse 32, that men are aware of the pending judgment of God, they're aware of their own depravity and sin, they're without excuse for rejecting Christ. Both are true. Both are absolutely true. In chapter 2, verse 1, Paul uses a series of present tense verbs and participles to make this point very clear. The moralist, here's what a moralist is. A moralist is the kind of religious person that is continually and habitually passing judgment on others. They are continually and habitually overlooking the fact that they have continually and habitually been guilty of doing the same kinds of things. As I pointed out, the pronoun another means another of a different kind. So what these people are notorious for doing is looking at people that are over there. They're not good like us. They're over there. And these people are a different kind of people, and they're continually making their judgment calls and not realizing we've done the same stuff. In other words, the moralist habitually points out the wicked things other people do, and yet in their lifetime they've done the same kinds of things. Now verse 1 is filled with a bunch of legal terms in a courtroom. In fact, the term without excuse is a term that is a legal forensic term, and this particular term indicates there's no legal defense that he can give that's going to stand up in court before God. You have the term judge, that is used there in verse 1. That is also a legal forensic term that speaks about a forensic decision or judgment. And then you have the word condemn. That also is a legal term that's pronounced in a courtroom setting. And what Paul is saying here is a moralist who's always spotting the sin in other people and making judgments concerning their sin, but has never come to terms with his own sin, is legally guilty before God and will legally be condemned by God because that person needs to realize, I've sinned also and I need the righteousness of God and I don't have it. And by my pointing out their sin, I'm actually refusing to acknowledge how I've sinned. Let's see if we can prove it. See if we can prove it. Let's take some of the list of sins in chapter 1 and see if we can prove it. You ever given yourself over to anything lustful? Guilty. Ever had any sexual experience outside of marriage? Guilty. 
Ever had any same-sex immoral experience? Guilty. Ever been greedy? Ever coveted something someone else had? Guilty. Ever been envious or jealous of someone? What they have, what they are, what they've accomplished? Guilty. Ever gossiped about someone behind their back? These are the list of things that he went through in chapter 1. Ever gossiped about someone behind their back? Guilty. Ever bragged or boasted about yourself or your accomplishments or achievements? Guilty. Ever disobeyed your parents? Didn't honor them right? Guilty. Ever take something that didn't belong to you in your lifetime? Guilty. Ever did something that didn't honor God and his word ever in your life? Guilty. Guilty. Ever stretch the truth a little bit to make yourself look good? Guilty. Isn't it true what Paul's saying here? Isn't it true we've all sinned? Isn't it true if you're honest you can build your own case against yourself? Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, He who doubts total depravity better study himself. There's nothing, nothing so damning as dishonesty when it comes to God and our own sin. And the moralist, he can spot it in others. He can talk about it. He can protest against it. He can see it. But he's not honest enough to admit, you know, there's been a time in my life when I did the same kind of thing. And Paul says the moralist who is not honest with himself is heading to the same condemnation as the heathen. I don't think we're ever probably going to have real honest justice coming from any forensic court Because you have, for the most part, people in the court system that can't seem to judge themselves right. And until you have someone that's in high positions of power that can judge themselves right, they're in no position to judge others right. And Paul says every person on this earth had better be able to judge themselves right. Because every human being needs the righteousness of God in order to have a relationship with God. And the reason why we need the righteousness of God is we're all sinners. And until a moralist is willing to admit that about himself or herself and willing to invite the Lord Jesus Christ into the life to be Savior, they're lost and they're guilty, just as guilty as the heathen. That's his point. Now, the second reason why the moralist is guilty and condemned is because God will judge the moralist honestly and accurately. Verses 2 to 16. We learn a great deal about the judgment of God in verses 2 to 16. We learn a great deal about the assessment that God is going to give. Number one, it's going to be thorough. It'll be a thorough judgment. It will be legal coming from the highest court in the universe, the court of God, it will be personal. It'll be broken down into every person's situation, circumstances, and life. It will be individual. No individual is going to be able to blame somebody else for their own problems because it'll be individual. It'll be impartial. God's not going to play favorites in this. I mean, it'll be a true, accurate, impartial judgment. It'll be factual. Based on facts, based on truth, and it will be final. Every individual needs to understand this about the coming judgment of God. Every single person needs to understand this about the coming judgment of God. If you do not have the righteousness of God and you get before God, you lose. And the righteousness of God is only found in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we get it. It's a court case. We'll talk about it later in this book. It's a court scene in which God literally gives us the righteousness of God to those who have believed in his Son. Now, there are, as near as I can determine, eight judgment facts that are revealed in verses 2 to 16. The first judgment fact is God's condemnatory judgment against sinners is right. 
Notice verse 2, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Paul says, we know. We know. God's judgment is right. God's judgment is true. God's judgment is not a judgment that's going to be based on appearances. God's judgment will be reality judgment. God's judgment is a kind of judgment in which there are no religious charades that can be played. God is never going to be fooled by external religious stuff. I mean, people can go through all the external religious motions that they want to go through. That isn't going to fool God because he sees the heart. He sees the hypocrisy. He sees the life. And when God decides to make a judgment, it'll be a right judgment, and it will be aimed at those who habitually practice sinful things. What we need to understand is, apart from the righteousness of God, that's the way God sees every one of us. Our works are as filthy rags. Apart from having the righteousness of God that's found in Jesus Christ, what is happening here is the judgment of God is aimed straight at us, and he sees us as just doing one sinful thing after another. The second fact that's brought out about God's judgment is it will be inescapable. We learn in verse 3, But you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You know, in this life, you can maybe get away with a crime. Some people do. You might get away with it because nobody catches you. Since the 1960s, there have been 200,000 unsolved murders in this country. Over 200,000 unsolved murders from people who seem to get away with murder. You might commit a crime and flee and escape and go to another country that is beyond the boundaries of legal jurisdiction. There are three countries that are known as non-extradition countries. In other words, if you are a criminal and commit a crime, you go to one of those three countries, you can get away with it. Notice I'm not naming the countries. I'm not. (laughs) We have a worldwide audience on this stuff, so I'm not tipping my hand on this. But there are three of them. You might commit a crime, get caught, tried, and even though you're guilty, you go before a corrupt judge, you might basically walk away having committed the crime. More and more convicted criminals are being set free. I mean, we had a guy who just a week ago had been convicted of DUIs. He'd been convicted of fleeing the police. They let him go and he killed a guy in North Dakota. You might get caught and tried and convicted and sentenced and punished, and you might escape. In the last 18 months, 29 people have escaped from federal prison. One half of them are still out there somewhere, free. Or you might get caught, tried, convicted, and punished. All of those are possible options if you commit a crime here in this country, but it isn't that way with God. Paul said, don't you dare think for one second you're going to escape his indictment. You know you've done things from that previous list, and you know some of those things you've done on a semi-regular basis, and you better own it. So Paul says, don't kid yourself about this point. You can't hide from the Lord. You can't escape his judgment because God has his own calculation of people and his calculation is inescapable. And apart from the righteousness of God that is only found in Jesus Christ, every single person will stand before him condemned and no one's going to be able to con God or get out of the judgment. The third fact is God's condemnatory judgment against sinners comes after giving them a time of repentance. Verse 4, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing the kindness of God leads you to repentance? This is where the moralist makes a fatal miscalculation. See, a person who's never really come to terms with the Lord Jesus Christ in his or her life thinks that because I basically have a good life, 
And nothing real bad's happening to me. I must be pretty good in the sight of God. In fact, I guess I'm kind of getting away with my sin. Just because you've received some blessings, some people conclude, because we have these blessings, I don't have a thing to fret about when it comes to judgment. What Paul says is, this is what you don't realize. The only reason God is not judged yet is because his grace, the riches of his grace, his mercy, his patience, his kindness, is giving sinners opportunity and time to repent, to change their mind about things. That's what the word repent means, change your thinking. What God is basically saying is, I'm giving people time to actually come to terms with the fact that they need the righteousness of my son. They view this as just their A-OK in life. God says, I'm giving them time so they can come to terms with truth. And the truth is, they've sinned against me and they need the righteousness that's only found in my son. That's the truth. And Paul says, don't think for one second that this period of time that you have that seems to be going so good is because you're going to escape judgment. That's not it. He's giving you time to come to terms with reality. Fourth fact is God's condemnatory judgment against sinners is given to sinners who have stubborn and unrepentant hearts. Verse 5 says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That is an interesting word, stubbornness. It's sclerosis. We get our English word sclerosis from this particular Greek word. It's a word that refers to like a hardening of something. In the case of sclerosis, it's a hardening of arteries. In this case, it's a hardening of heart against spiritual truth. And Paul says, what you don't realize is that you're storing up wrath against yourself. In fact, the storing up is like a treasure chest. You've got a treasure chest you don't even realize you have. He said the treasure chest, apart from the righteousness of God, is being filled up with wrath. Your own private treasure chest of wrath. Because you refuse to realize, I need a righteousness that's only found in Jesus Christ. The moralist has somehow convinced himself, duped himself into believing that he's right with God because nothing really bad seems to be happening at the present moment. And God says, you need to know this. You are the target of the righteousness of God and you're storing up this treasure chest of wrath against yourself because you refuse to come to terms with the honest sin that you've committed against the Lord and your own stubborn, unrepentant heart is causing you to just dig your heels in and not believe in Jesus Christ. And even though you know deep down inside you've committed horrible sins against God, somehow in your mind and your heart, you've dismissed them from realizing, I'm going to give an account for that stuff. People who refuse to admit their own sins and turn to Jesus Christ are stubborn, unrepentant fools. They're heading to experiencing the wrath of God. They're storing it up every day. That sin account is like a savings bank account. Every little sin is put into that treasure chest of wrath. Every little sin is adding more and more to the account. Every little lust, every little gossip, every little moment of greed, every little hunger for power, every little outburst of anger, every little selfish act going more and more into that account. It's getting bigger and bigger, larger and larger. problem for the moralist, he doesn't see that about himself. And by using these words, stubborn and unrepentance, I come to this conclusion. It is possible for a moralist to actually harden the arteries of their heart one too many times. It's possible to harden the heart, choke off the truth. God says that's it. You've got this treasure chest waiting for you. 
when you leave that world and your soul comes into eternity. Which brings us to the fifth fact, God's condemnatory judgment against sinners will be based on each person's work. We read in verse 6, who will render to each person according to his deeds. It'll be the person in God. Each person. You can't answer this for anybody else other than yourself. You need the righteousness of God or here's the reality of it. Verse 6 starts with a thesis. God will render to every person according to their works. That means he'll give back. He'll make a return based on what that person does with his son. Now keep in mind what Isaiah said about our works. They are as filthy rags in the sight of God. No matter how good you think your works are, the fact of the matter is, apart from having the righteousness of God that is found in Jesus Christ, that's the way God sees it. And he describes in these verses two types of people that will stand before the Lord. Verse 7, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Drop down to verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And verse 16, on the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. The first type of person is the person who sought for the glory, honor, and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel Paul's presenting here. To the one who's willing to humble himself or herself and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be glory, honor, and peace. This is the person who sought good by responding to the word of God. This is the person who realized, I am a sinner. I need the righteousness of God. That kind of person sought to glorify God and honor God and live with a focus on eternity. And that kind of person is going to experience everlasting life. That's type number one. Type number two, though, are those that selfishly refused to believe in Jesus Christ. They wanted to rely on their own ambitions and works. Verse 8, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also to the Greek. So to every person who relies upon their own ambitions and their own works, the end result, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, is wrath, indignation, tribulation, distress on every soul. You see, what's at stake in the matter of salvation is the matter of your own soul. And here's the truth of it. We're all sinners. This is what Paul's proven in this section. We are all sinners. We're all guilty. But the one who admits it comes to terms with it. Says, you know what? I'm not relying on my works to make me right with God. I'm relying on that wonderful work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm trusting him to save me. I'm not trusting me. I'm trusting him. That one will have glory and honor. But those who want to rely upon their own selves will have disgrace, shame, and wrath. The sixth fact is God's condemnatory judgment will not be based on any partiality. Verse 11, for there's no partiality with God. You know, we live in a world that's just political and partial. Who you know, rather than what you know. Who you are rather than what you really are. That's what I did love about Bo Schembechler. Bo Schembechler, who used to be the coach for Michigan, said, I don't care who the player is. They walk on this field, they're given a shot. I don't care where they come from. I don't care if they have a scholarship or not. I don't care what their reputation is. I don't care what their previous success was. If they walk on this field and can play, they're going to play. Totally impartial in the way he analyzed that. God says, that's the way it's going to be when people get before me. There's not going to be partiality shown. There's not going to be favoritism shown here. It won't matter 
what the person was, what the person did, what the person accomplished. It won't matter how much fame a person had, how much money they made, the offices they held, the success they held. God says, I'm going to judge every person in view of my righteous standards, and it will show that everybody is guilty and condemned unless they have the righteousness of my son. That's the way I'm going to judge this thing. I'll be totally impartial in that. No one is going to get before God and try to manipulate that. Now, you might be able to manipulate or sway people, but it's not going to work with God. And it won't matter what the ethnicity, it won't matter what the gender, it won't matter what the sin. God says, you either have my son's righteousness when you get before me, or I'll judge you not based on any partiality, and you'll lose. You'll lose. Which brings us to the seventh fact. God's condemnatory judgment against sinners will condemn all. That's just what he says, verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. God says the sin will condemn everybody, law or no law. In fact, if people have had the law, then I'll just call up the law and show how they've sinned. If they didn't have the law, I'll just call up and show how they've sinned. They knew they were doing stuff that wasn't right. They knew it was wrong. They knew it was against God. He said, I don't care. They're all guilty. Moral, immoral, doesn't matter. I'll call up the record. If they have the law, don't have the law, they've all sinned. And then he says, eighthly, I'll base my judgment on the secret heart stuff. Verse 13, for it's not the hearers of the law that are just before God, the doers will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having a law are a law to themselves, in that day the work of the law written in their hearts and their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Look at that. What's at stake is, in verse 13, how can I be justified before God? How can a person get before the Lord and have him justify the person? How is that one able to stand before God and have God declare a person righteous when, if we're honest, we know we've all sinned and we aren't righteous? How is that possible? Furthermore, we know that no sinful, finite human has ever kept the law of God. Paul would say in Galatians, no one can be right with God by trying to keep the law of God. So what does Paul mean in verse 13 when he says that the doers of the law will be just before God? Well, since Paul says no one can be justified by the law, since Paul says the law was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ, what does he mean? Well, to be a hearer of the law would be you hear what the law says, namely, we're all guilty. The law proves that we're all guilty. It condemns us all. To be a doer of a law would mean that we realize we're all guilty and we need to get a righteousness we don't have that's only found by faith in Jesus Christ. To be justified before God, we must be declared righteous by God. And the only way we can get God to declare us righteous is to have his son, Jesus Christ, in our lives. The law is the judge. And to be righteous before God via law... You would have had to have kept every commandment ever been given, and nobody has done that except one person, Jesus Christ. Well, what about people that didn't have the law? How could they be guilty? Paul says God will call up their life. He's given them this intuition, this innateness inside their heart. They understand when they do things that are wrong. People have a conscience that either excuses them or it accuses them. They know it. When they do something, they either do something wrong and they either say, ah, that's just me, I'll just continue on doing, or they get convicted that they've done something wrong. But he said, either way, they're not going to get before God and be innocent. If one studies the written law of God, he's without excuse for not seeing his own guilt. I mean, just do it. Take Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You read through those books. And pretty soon, you're going to see something there, and you'll go, well, I didn't, I didn't quite keep that. 
Or you'll read something you should have done and you'll go, I didn't do that. Or you'll read something you shouldn't have done, you'll say, I did that. The moment you come to terms with truth, you're guilty. Now the question is, how can you clear the slate? How can you have a relationship with God based on the fact that we all know we've all sinned against God? And that is, we must have the righteousness of God given to us as a gift. And there's only one place we can get the righteousness of God, and that is by faith in Jesus Christ. And verse 16 makes it very clear that God is going to base this judgment on secret things. See, you can't play the game on Sunday with God. Secret stuff. People thought nobody saw that. Nobody knows that happened. You take that list of sins in chapter 1, ask yourself this question. How many of those things have you done in secret? If God were to have us face him in court... How many in that list would you say, nobody else knows. I got this game figured out on Sunday. Nobody else sees it. How many of that would be in your secret list? God says, understand this. You have a treasure chest. I'm storing it up. Even the secret stuff. And when you get before me, apart from righteousness that's given by me to you because you've believed in my son, you'll experience my wrath. Take an honest look at yourself. This passage of scripture really challenges every one of us to do that. Take an honest look at yourself and see yourself for who you truly are. We're all sinners. We all need a savior. I mean, this text proves that. We all need a Savior. The Savior is Jesus Christ. You believe on him and you'll be saved. Here are your options. You can proudly rely on yourself. You can harden your heart to this truth. You're already condemned if you do that. Or you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But here's the truth of this. We need the righteousness of God. In and of ourselves, we don't have it. So it must be given to us by God. There's one place you can get it. There's one person from whom you can get it. That one person is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe on him, God will give you the righteousness of God that gives you everlasting life. Let's pray. If you've never invited the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, we would encourage you to do it right now, right where you sit. Just admit the facts. You know you're a sinner just like everybody else knows that we are sinners. We all know it. We're all sinners. So just acknowledge that to God and get his righteousness that's found in Jesus Christ. Invite Jesus Christ to come in to your life, into your soul, and save you. Father, we thank you for the truths that you've revealed to us in this great gospel of grace. And it is grace. This is just grace. We meander down through these 16 verses, and we realize, Lord, that you have a case against every one of us, and There's no partiality shown with you, and we're all guilty. We all stand condemned. And then to think of the fact that we can have the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, that is grace, and we say thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.